Welcome back. We've seen how bigger models can achieve higher accuracy if trained on more data. So a natural question to ask next is, what's preventing us from training really big models? Why can't we train models with billions or trillions of parameters in them? The answer, usually, is memory. We run out of memory. Um, training has moved to accelerator platforms like GPUs. GPUs have fast memories, high bandwidth memories. But one of the challenges in building memories is it's really hard to build really fast and really big memories. So it's really hard for a memory to be really fast and really big at the same time. So accelerators like GPUs usually make a trade-off and select a balance between uh, speed of the memory and the capacity of the memory. So we end up currently with sizes like a few tens of gigabytes per accelerator. So it's pretty common to be able to find a high-end GPU that might have 16 gigabytes, 32 gigabytes. Maybe uh, if you're really willing to pay a lot of money right now, uh, maybe you can get up to 64 gigabytes. Um, so this works out pretty well, as long as your model doesn't need more than 64 gigabytes of memory. And if it does, it crashes. So sometimes frameworks have support for things like paging. Uh, where if you try and train a model that's really big, uh, it'll page it out to disk or page it out to a slower memory, like the CPU memory. But then the whole training process goes super slow and sometimes it grinds to a halt. And I haven't seen a lot of models that are able to deal with this. So practically speaking, you get the amount of memory that's in your accelerator and if you exceed that, uh, things don't go so well. And so the amount of memory in the accelerator places an upper limit on the size of model that can be trained. And in practice, we find that um, when we're trying to train bigger models more than other kinds of constraints, like for example, um, the training time, um, this memory limit places a, a constraint on the biggest model that we can train. If we look at the roadmap for memory, um, we'd like to find ways of improving this. So one way of improving this situation is just uh, building bigger memories. So why can't we build an accelerator with a terabyte of memory or a petabyte of memory? And there is a roadmap. So accelerators typically use DRAM. Um, there is a roadmap to making DRAM higher capacity. Um, we're seeing uh, rates of improvement that might, you know, maybe by uh, 2020, um, we might have, you know, around 64 or 32 gigabytes of uh, memory, uh, maybe around 2025. Uh, we might get up, um, you know, some factor higher than that. So we might get up between maybe 256 gigabytes, maybe 512 gigabytes of memory. Um, so we're going to get some uh, improvement by just waiting uh, for better and higher capacity DRAM technology. I know a lot of our friends who are building these uh, memories are working really hard on, on delivering higher capacity. Um, but what are we going to do today? So I want to mention here uh, two... Um, moves for people who really want to train really big models um, but they don't want to wait around for five or ten years uh, for the size of memories to increase. Um, so there are two options here. So one option is the one that at least to me feels like it's the best one or, or um, it's the one that I sometimes feel like you know having seen a bunch of projects that uh, I just can't believe we haven't done this one yet. Um, so it's common to train deep neural networks on servers with a lot of accelerators in them. For example, um, it's common if you go and actually look at the server that's training your model on, for example, Google Cloud, uh, Amazon Web Services. Um, if you look at that server up close, you'd see that there's not just one accelerator in it. There'd be several. There might be four accelerators, there might be eight accelerators, sometimes there might even be more, like 16 accelerators. And the way that software is written today, we don't use all of the memory that's in these servers. We typically train one model, the parameters for one model, on one accelerator. And so we're limited by the memory capacity of that one accelerator. Now there's this long history of work on distributed linear algebra operations. How do you take something like a matrix multiplication or a convolution and distribute it over many accelerators? If you did this intelligently, you could effectively use the entire memory capacity of that server to train a much bigger model. 
So this might give you a 10x, 32x boost in the effective size of a model that you could train. If only you could put all those accelerator memories together um, and use them at once. And it turns out for a lot of models, um, you know, this would actually work out pretty well. Uh, you can look at the amount of time it takes to transfer data between accelerators, and it isn't too much. Um, it is something that has to be overcome, but uh, often there are real ways around it. And so I so sometimes ask, like, why aren't we doing this today? And the number one reason is just software. No one's written the code to do it. Um, it's not super easy software to write. Um, but there are a bunch of projects, especially in high-performance computing, that have done similar, uh, similar things, and they've been deployed and used really successfully. And so the biggest challenge that we have today, why can't we use model parallelism, this is sometimes called model parallelism, is just we don't have frameworks that support model parallelism. Um, so one of the easiest avenues going forward, uh, and this is one of the key lessons learned of building frameworks and training a lot of models, um, memory is a huge concern. Uh, one of these really simple ways that if only we could exploit it would give us a lot more memory is model parallelism. And so uh, although there have been a lot of research efforts, like for example in Mesh TensorFlow and LBNN from uh, Lawrence Berkeley um, and Lawrence Livermore Labs, um, these things have not made it uh, into frameworks yet. So there's a, there's a great opportunity uh, to boost up the uh, size of models that we can train if only we can um, you know, figure out how to take advantage of model parallelism. And finally, there's one other avenue uh, that I'll mention here um, for reducing the memory consumption. Um, if you look at the memory consumption of models, oftentimes uh, most of it goes into the activations and not into the uh, parameters themselves. So any algorithmic changes that can reduce the amount of memory that's required for uh, activations can really significantly cut down on the total memory requirements for training a model. So I want to mention uh, one particular technique here that would be super easy to implement in a lot of optimizers, but as far as I can tell, isn't there. Um, that's sub-batching. So this is the idea that uh, when you're training a deep neural network, you're training it with a mini-batch. So these are a subset of your total training data set that you're uh, evaluating your model on uh, in a single computational step. And this is done for some algorithmic reasons. It's also done for some computational reasons. Um, like adding more parallelism. Um, but in particular here, as you increase the mini batch size, you increase the memory requirements. Um, so there's actually a really simple trick that would just say, um, even for the same algorithmic mini batch size, would just serialize the computation. Um, one way to compute the results for a single mini batch is to compute them all in parallel. You could also compute them serially. So, for example, take the first element in the mini batch and uh, figure out what the gradients are. Uh, then take the second element in the mini batch, figure out what the gradients are, uh, and just repeat that for the whole mini batch. And then at the end, just add them all together, or average them all together, depending on how your optimizer works. And in that way, um, the memory requirement uh, for evaluating that mini batch would be uh, reduced by. Um, you know, the size of the mini batch because you'd only be evaluating one element at a time. And even though the evaluation of, you'd have to eventually evaluate all of the different elements, you could throw away the intermediate uh, buffers used to store uh, features and to store deltas. Um, and this would lead to a giant memory savings. So we actually have a lot of opportunities here to make neural networks much more efficient uh, by reducing the memory capacity that they take to train. Uh, I mentioned two. One is uh, model parallelism and one is sub-batching. Um, there are probably more. Um, so uh, going forward, I'm really hopeful that uh, we can implement some of these and we can train a lot bigger neural networks.